The guy who successfully tricked the Shark Tank. Shark Tank is one of those rare reality TV shows that's good, it's fun to watch. It has the right formula for everyday people to just find it binge-worthy entertainment. If you were to boil it down to the main reason for the show's success, it would have to be conflict. Everyone on the show is constantly arguing, and viewers absolutely love it. But why is that? Well, for one, humans have always been fascinated by conflict. It's the easiest way drama. to get the adrenaline going without moving an inch. People also just really love drama. And on Shark Tank, the arguments are especially intense because they revolve around something that interests a lot of people. Money. The sharks yeah, themselves yeah. are a huge part of this appeal. It's this bigger-than-life personality. They're supposed to be smart, seasoned investors who pride themselves on their ability to spot a good deal and avoid scams. Which but they don't always follow through. Some of the like, some of the huge Shark Tank ones is like what the the Scrub Daddy. The Scrub Daddy was like way, way, way too big, bro. For what it is, it's a sponge, bro. <laughs> the Scrub Daddy was crazy. Which was somewhat true until they met this guy. 500,000 from Mark Cuban for 15%. And 500,000 from the rest of the sharks, we're gonna split it right. for a total of 30% for $1 million and the power of Shark Tank. What are you going to do? I'm not Except bad talking it. This is Charles Yim, the notorious it's inventor just like, it's of a the sponge. first smartphone breathalyzer, which he, of course, called the breathometer. With a name like that, you know, how couldn't this be a smash hit? Breathometer is a prime example of how a great pitch can fool even the shrewdest of minds. Bro, there's no way this works, though. Wait, how? Thometer, the world's first smartphone breathalyzer. But the real question is how did he do it? From what I've seen of the show, all the sharks, and especially Mark Cuban, are pretty sharp at calling out scam business models. There's examples of this from the show, like the time they destroyed Minus Cal for claiming their fat-blocking snack bars and tablets could cut 100 calories from meals just by taking two pills. Mark Cuban was the first one to spot this and seem initially skeptical. The evidence shows that the people who took our product versus the placebo uh, also lost weight. Look guys, you know I'm a skeptic on yes. all this stuff. You can't claim that it's going to reduce 100 calories out of what you eat by taking two pills. Uh, we don't make that claim. That's what he said. But of course, the further it went on, everybody else joined in. It won't let's, make let's, you lose let's, weight. Let's, it will help you. It will help you lose weight, but it won't make you lose weight. Actually, Carl, now, now you're pissing me off. Yeah. <laughs> you're well, digging I, I a deeper hole. And it's got nothing to do with You're kind of losing you credibility. Just, you just said you're not. Yo, 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 yo. That's just not something you want to, like, bring to Shark Tank, right? Like, anything that, like, bene benefits health is, like, uh, like you, you got to have you got to have the major facts to back that up, bro. You said you're not losing weight. What does it say right what? here? And Mark again was at the forefront of when he tore into Manish Sethi of Pavlok, who pitched a watch that zapped its users to break bad habits. Persian therapy is legit, but what's not legit is trying to take credit for other studies and apply it to your product. He labeled the product nonsense and even went as far to call Manish a con artist. Sorry, it's nonsense, Robert. You're such a, a con artist. So obviously they can be brutally honest and they're not. Yeah, they're supposed the to be. They're so investors. How exactly? did Charles manage to win all of them over? Funnily enough, somebody on YouTube comments summed this up pretty well. Little did anyone know, Charles was the shark in that room. So let's take a look. For some background, a breathalyzer is a device used to detect the amount of alcohol in a person's body, often called the blood alcohol yeah. concentration or BAC for short. However, the thing about traditional high quality breathalyzers is that they're both expensive and large enough to be a hassle to carry around. Charles Yim came out on the show with his revolutionary breathometer, Maybe. a device that he claimed fixes both of these issues and more. It was supposed to work just as accurately as a regular breathalyzer. It could be used by plugging it into your smartphone and even let you- it, It's like, uh, it's using the battery from your phone to like turn it on and whatnot, but like how would it, how does it calculate your- Yeah, I'll stream tomorrow, yeah.
to hail a cab with the push of a button, you know, in case you got carried away at the club that night and the breathalyzer was telling you, no, you can't drive. Obviously, this was fake, which we found out later. But how was he able to convince the judges? Well, it's always going to be true that if you have some kind of background, people are more inclined to believe you. For example, when J.D. Claridge and Charles Manning pitched their drone company, Xcraft. Yeah, so uh, I have worked um, an aerospace engineer by trade. I started at uh, a school and worked at Oracle and have been in software my whole history. All the sharks agreed to be in on the deal and the duo got three times the money they originally asked for. Similarly, Charles knew exactly what he was talking about. Not only did he have a tech background. Oh, but are you a software guy? You're a hardware design guy? So I used to code back in the day. He was also working with modern sensors, something that Mark Cuban even claimed was the future of technology. I'm, I'm a big fan of the sensor business. I've got a company, Motion Law. We're all about sensors, and I think that's the future of technology. But much like the technical background giving somebody more credibility, a Yo. business background, especially in a room full of investors, will definitely increase the likelihood of them trusting you. And for Charles, that's exactly what he also had. If you sold your last business and you did very well, why don't you take some of that money and invest it in this? I have. Uh, so I started off with the first initial 50,000. I've already raised half a million dollars in total from angels. If you watch enough Shark Tank, you're gonna see business experiences in short supply because most pictures are from first timers who yes. just entered the world of business They they, they create something in their garage, right? And then, and then they think it's like this insane idea that they wanna to share to the world. Yeah, yeah, that's usually how things like this work. Charles, by contrast, was a senior- So having a background in business and the knowledge to like sit here and, and talk it up. Yo, he is, he's playing them, bro. I want to know what about this is a scam. I don't know how it's calculating your like blood alcohol percentage. ...successful entrepreneur who had already built and sold his first company in just 18 months, which certainly helped sway the shark's favor. I built and sold my last company within 18 months. It gave them some idea, some proof that Charles and his ideas can be trusted. We know this to be true because in the previous season, season four, Maria and Veronica pitched a unique bed bug detection system, which eventually got all five sharks to invest with a little persuasion. Even though they were offered $5 million for the trademarks and patents from another company, they refused the offer because they believed buggy beds was worth way more. And you turned that down? Yes. I know what we have here. I know the value. The sharks saw this rejection in the same light as proof that the buggy beds product could be trusted with their money because other people were after it and because the owners were smart enough to knock this deal back and wait for more. I've never heard of buggy bed. Where Where is buggy bed today? Another aspect that made Yim a solid contestant in the shark's eyes was his long-term vision. During his pitch, he talked about ideas he had for future products like a similar sensor-based device for detecting diabetes and another product that he did launch years later with Philips, though that product was taken off shelves as well, but that's a story for later. And of course, there's okay. always going to be one thing that sets people apart in any room you enter, and that is confidence. He was a smooth-talking, confident man. Not only was his pitch perfect, he also tackled difficult questions from Mr. Wonderful without any hesitation. First and foremost, there's no replacement for good judgment. And so the Prothometer device basically promotes uh, making smarter and safer decisions. We provide instruction manual. We clearly label disclaimers throughout the app. Though, as you can see by now, his pitch was nearly perfect. I mean, even I would have invested in this if the product came to me. Well, maybe if I had $500,000 just lying yeah. around, of course. But even if you take away all the things that the pitch had, that Charles had, the biggest thing is that the product, the breathometer, had the legs to stand on its own as it solved a massive problem. To give you an idea of just how massive, drunk driving crashes claim nearly 37 lives per day in America. In 2022 alone, nearly 14,000 yeah, Americans met their deaths and through an sad. accident that could easily have been prevented. But perhaps the biggest reason Mark invested in the breathometer went beyond market value and potential profits. Maybe the reason was a lot more personal for him. Yeah. In an interview with CBS, Mark's younger brother, Brian Cuban, shared that he suffered from an alcohol addiction for decades. Nothing changed the image in the yeah. mirror, no matter how, much, how much Xanax, how much alcohol I drank. 
I woke up in the morning, I hated myself even more. I, it was the same guy in the mirror. This undoubtedly would have been difficult on Mark. Mark is known for sometimes thinking of his family when investing in new businesses, attaching his sentimental value to his investments. A perfect example of this is when he offered $400,000 for 15% equity after hearing 19-year-old Tania Speaks pitch her beauty company. This came with the condition that she meet his two teenage daughters. I have a daughter who's 14, and I have a daughter who's 17. But listen, Alexis, I want them to meet you, and I want them to learn from you, and maybe you'll even learn some from them. So for Mark, the breath okay. of mind to felt like yeah. the right product for him to invest at that time which is maybe why he ended up with a 15% stake in the company. But with that being said, by the end of the pitch, Charles had the sharks eating out of the palm of his hands. He squeezed out a million dollars of investment from all five of them, with Cuban taking the lion's share by investing 500,000. So all this sounds great, right? Up until this point, you're thinking, where does it all go wrong? Well, if you look at what happened after this episode aired, you'll find that Charles was stating his company was worth $50 million. However, looking closer, they only reached 40% of their sales goals with a turnover of only $4 million. We generated the 4.2 million that year. But that was not a number you were advertising. We were talking a $10 million number for Perthometer. We only delivered just over four. We had much bigger aspirations for that market. And of course, this is something that- Yeah, can be why solved. though? And Mark especially was planning to increase production with the Sharks investment. But unfortunately, this story takes a disappointing turn. You see, soon after securing the cash from the Sharks, Charles transported himself back to the year 2000 and went full YOLO. Instead of putting the money into product development, he blew it on epic vacations and wild parties, living it up like there was no tomorrow. It are there not like, are there not like contracts to do like, uh, so you don't do all this stuff? I feel like there has to be, right? That you, you have to like show proof of, uh, of like investments into production there's not almost feels like he already planned out his expenses from the very beginning i mean you can even hear with this clip what mark had to say about what was happening charles um i look at his instagram and he'd be in bora bora and I look at his oh, Instagram. Oh, this guy's oh, shit. Yes. What? Two weeks later, and he'd be in Vegas partying, you know. Then so according to Mark, it seemed pretty obvious what Charles's plans were. And it didn't seem to involve running the company in any form or legitimate manner. Then he'd be on Nectar Island with Richard Branson. And I'd, I'd text him, like, what the fuck are you doing? You're supposed to be working. Oh, no, I'm networking. And obviously, it's just a hilarious thing to say that you're, you know, networking. Networking, by going yeah. out partying and flying all over the world. Finding lavishly. connections. Next thing you know, all the money's gone. By the time Kevin O'Leary asked Charles for an update on Beyond the Tank, the company was already falling apart. This company that's worth almost $50 million, 80% of its value is on a product that hasn't even shipped yet. Yet, Charles was still adamant he was a, and I'll, I'll quote him here, pretty supreme networker and that he met okay, Richard Branson bro. Mark Cuban through those networking skills. The second that I've been told actually is I'm a pretty supreme networker. So if I wanted to meet somebody, I mean, I was intentionally wanting to meet Mark Cuban. I intentionally wanted to meet Richard Branson. Um, and I figured basically my nodes or people that I knew in terms of how to get to him or if it was a competition or if it was, you know, through a particular event. Overconfidence or, or pure bullshit. I'm not sure, but it doesn't really matter. Pure does bullshit. It? What matters dude. is let's the end be result. let's be real. I mean, after all, you could be the best at something, but if it turns to nothing, you know, who cares how good you were? Exactly. But the one thing you can fall back on with this story is that the breathometer was still a good product and did what it claimed, right? Right? Well, no, no, it didn't. In 2016, okay. soon after the launch of Breeze, the Bluetooth version of the original breathometer. Customers began complaining. Inaccurate readings, a buggy app, and the device's failure to work, these complaints were all over the scathing customer reviews. As one user on Best Buy put it, tried setting up the item once I came home, but the required iOS app never worked. The device could not be set up. Another said the device simply didn't work at all. Could not get it to work. Brought it back to get a second one. That worked for about 10 minutes, then stopped. This is unacceptable. YouTubers, of course, jumped on this with tech oh, video easily, testing yeah. three smartphone-powered breathalyzers, including... Wait, I have that one. I have this one. 
I have this exact uh, same one. Original and Breeze from Breathometer. And according to his findings, Breeze was the most inaccurate of them. And then the most inconsistent of all of them was the Breathometer Breeze, the Bluetooth version. But that's not all because it never is. So the situation then got worse. With all the negative reviews pouring in, it's no surprise that in 2017, the Federal Trade Commission filed a complaint against the company for Damn. hyperbolic claims. According to the FTC, ads for both Original and Breeze claimed that the product had undergone, quote, government grade lab testing and were, quote, FDA registered, which was far from the truth. The company even doubled down on this claim in the FAQ section of the website. Now, of course, you're going to say company lying about what it does. Wow, that's a huge surprise, right? But of course, in the totality, this just gets worse and worse. And a more concerning fact was that both devices understated users' BAC levels, which is misleading at best and disastrous. Yo, yeah, understating is crazy. Nah, that... So, like, I wonder what, like, legal issues are coming up for this guy. Actually dangerous at worst. Yeah, that's, that's According to the immensely FTC, dangerous. Who, of course, investigated this. The company claimed their device can measure BAC levels from 0.02% to 0.25%. Yet, they never actually tested for them going beyond 0.02%. Now, imagine if somebody had downed a bottle and their breathometer suggested they could drive. Yeah. Well, that's obviously not going to end well, is it? What's even worse is that despite being aware of all the issues, the company never told consumers about the dangers of relying on their devices, which, let me remind you, would be the only reason to have the device in the first exactly. place. Exactly. So but if you feel like you have to take a breathalyzer to make sure you're able to drive, you probably shouldn't be driving, bro. I mean, let's be for real, okay? If you have to rely on something like this, you probably shouldn't drive. You should know your limits and not have to rely on something like this. But I can understand from past experiences to where I have used one of these and I was I was fine. If you can't rely on it, why does it even exist? Why would anybody buy this? Yeah. So what you have now is a founder who's spending all the money going off partying, lying to his, you know, partners who invested in the company, and a product that doesn't work, and even if it did, is not fit for purpose for anybody who would buy it in the first place. So what you now have is, well, nothing. Useless, uh, a useless the bit of tech. from the company was to tell retailers they would no longer be selling the product, but it was obviously still available for purchase at many stores, including Amazon and Best Buy. According to the FTC at this point, defendants were aware by at least March 2015 that Breeze devices produced inaccurate BAC readings. However, they failed to notify customers that the devices were inaccurate, could understate the user's BAC until June 2016, and failed to disable the breathometer app's breathalyzer function until October 6, 2016. Now, under pressure from the FTC, the scam company, which is all you can really call it, right. Thometer, was finally forced to send out warning emails to retailers and users about its inaccurate products in October of 2016. By that time, they'd already raked in $5.1 million in sales, but that didn't matter because they settled with the FTC and agreed to pay full refunds to any customers Ooh, who requested them. That which hurts. Sadly, of course, is not going to be everybody because a lot of right. people just don't bother. They see it as a as a lost product and then just don't get their money back. But even still, the story doesn't quite end there because after settling, Charles launched Mint in collaboration with Philips, a device that measured the indicators of poor oral health and bad breath. Charles, the ever confident con man, made some bold claims about the future of his products. What are the other things that you could do with this platform? It can extend into uh, actual diabetes, glucose monitoring, lung cancer detection, which is about detected with roughly about 90% accuracy. It wasn't enough that he was going to save the world from drunk driving originally and definitely right. didn't do that. He was now going to save people from lung cancer with detection in a tiny breath analysis device. Obviously, is an idea. Yeah, this would be a great technology that everyone would love to see. 
but at this point, who would trust this man to make it? Yeah, no one. Especially since after working well, no with one the should. Lynch, Mint was delisted from Amazon and the Breathometer store in 2021 for, surprise, surprise, not working as advertised. Crazy. And it just reads like the same story again when you look at the reviews. This device literally just randomly shows different results, not based on anything. Listen, listen. Who is at fault here? Is it is it at fault of the people not looking into the company that like actually never mind I'm not even gonna say that because you shouldn't have to right you shouldn't have to look at the reviews of the company themselves when a product is on like Amazon right yeah so like there's there's just it, it's his fault it's his fault every time I use it it gives me an A grade breath reading no matter what. When I first wake up, after eating, after brushing, it's always A. Sounds familiar, right? What a great product. But then you have to ask, what what did he have to say for himself? Well, after Nothing. hearing Mark Cuban go on the Full Send podcast and speak about his behavior, CNBC Make It reached out to Charles and asked. He claimed that he did not spend company money on travel and that Cuban's allegations were, quote, completely off. He also said that Cuban's claims were based on a series of Instagram posts and don't reflect on his abilities as CEO. In his words, you can't look at someone's social media and take it for face value. That's not how social media works. Which is and true, to be but... He's right. Yeah. He doesn't. Everyone posts their best life on social media. But if you compare what somebody's social media was like before they just received a million dollars in funding from the Sharks, and then after, as well as behind the scenes info of knowing where you are and what you're doing, well, it doesn't really matter at that point, does it? To add on top of this, Charles also claimed that the breathometer recently agreed to be acquired, but didn't provide any details to go along with this claim. His LinkedIn simply mentions, acquired by a family office. So of course, what? this was years ago. So you ask, where's Charles now? After all things are said and done, he's on the next the company inventor. Since the news about breathometer blew up, Charles has become more and more elusive. His Instagram is private, and the only way I could learn something about the guy was looking him up on LinkedIn. Which makes it seem like he's tired of being a pretty, pretty supreme, supreme networker. networker. According to the LinkedIn, he's now the founder and executive chairman of Vita Bowl, which was- Oh my god. Yeah, I knew it. He's on to the next scam, dude. He's on to the next scam! Founded in 2019, and Skeleton Labs, which was founded in 2020. He also built and sold another company in 2018, Cointopia, which was acquired by Vera Labs Inc. In his free time, Charles even mentors some of Stanford University's top entrepreneurs through StarTex, a non-profit organization that nurtures budding entrepreneurs through community and education. You know, who wouldn't want to be mentored by right. a guy who had repeatedly made failed products and sold them for money they wasn't worth and yeah. then had to pull them from stores because they didn't work? But he made his money though. So I mean... You say who would want to learn from him. Let's be for real. There's plenty of people that want to learn, like, scamming people, bro. I don't know. I don't then know. Then again, he made a bunch of money. So for people who call themselves entrepreneurs, typically on the internet, he probably is someone you'd want to learn from. But wait till you see exactly. this. So apparently Charles Yim not only took the money from the investors, you know, failed repeatedly, spent the money allegedly going out partying and things like that, failed multiple more products into the future and got away with it all. But now he's the founding partner of a $50 million investment fund. What an absolute legend. I mean, who can say failing upwards isn't a thing? Now, obviously, some people might look at this and see the full story and say, oh, it's pretty difficult to call Charles Yim a scammer. They might get Let's drawn in by real. his charisma, by the fact that people keep working with him and giving him money. He's like the definition of someone who scams someone, right? He, he has the, the smooth talking. He has, uh, he, he brings, he does bring facts to back up his and only his side of the story, right? He, he doesn't show you the full, the full information. Like, you, you know, you know how people do it today. They crop out the stuff that like tackles the the cons only shows the pros stuff like that he, he's like a he's, he's a man of of uh, scamming yeah money building up a rich resume but this isn't new this isn't something that's exclusive only to charles you nope. 
In business, this is incredibly common. And just to address the elephant, the fact the breathometer eventually devolved into a shitty one-star product doesn't take away from the fact that it's still probably a pretty decent idea if it was ever executed properly. Going back through the review- Yeah, he has good ideas. Let's be for real, the, the ideas are good, but the execution is terrible because you have the wrong person at the at the helm of the ship, you know? You have the wrong person there. On Best Buy, you can see people appreciated the idea of a sleek pocket breathalyzer, and they were just expressing disappointment in its poor execution. Yeah. One user wrote, I love the idea of this product, but it's just not good quality. Even Mark Cuban, who said it was the worst investment he had ever made, couldn't Very help good but acknowledge idea. it was a great product that sadly didn't reach its full potential. But you would blow into it and it did alcohol detection. And it was a great idea yeah. and actually a decent product. And of course, other companies have gone on in the future to do something very similar, but better, such as Backtrack, who yep. make police breathalyzers to... and are actually approved by the FDA. Like the breathometer, they also launched with a smartphone breathalyzer and are well known for their keychain breathalyzers. Yep. The only difference between these two companies is that one works and one <laughs> never did. So there we go. I leave it up to you, the audience. Was this guy actually a scammer? It no, he's a scammer. It's clear cut to me what he did, especially with what he was doing right after and where the money allegedly went, as well as the repeat history of releasing products that just outright don't work. And it just goes to show for Shark Tank, no one's ever too experienced to be taken for a ride. If you think you are, that's probably when it's going to happen to you. But there we yep. go. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Just like it, just like the people who say they're the best drivers in the world, right? Yeah, they're setting themselves up for failure. They really are. Like, uh, what, what, what's an experience from that? Uh, Jack Doherty, Jack Doherty, sat here and claimed he was the best driver in the world until he crashed his McLaren. Yeah. Yo, W video, W video, man. I like that. Uh, really, uh, really showed us that Shark Tank can be scammed if you have the knowledge. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Definitely a scammer, though.